So um, I lived through the internet revolution. I'm sure some of the people in the room did. Some of, your, some of you have children who grew up with the internet where information is widely accessible. Maybe they forgot the bad old days. But information used to be proprietary. Used to be if you wanted a stock market feed, you had to set up a circuit to the stock market. Um, if you then wanted an associated press feed, you had to create a circuit to the associated press. It was, it was a bit of a mess. And, and it was slow. It seemed like it might be fast enough, but you couldn't watch a cat video anytime you wanted to like you could now. Um, the interesting thing was that it didn't really seem so slow. It seemed like it was actually pretty good. New technology always kind of seems pretty good. What you don't see is what's not happening because the technology can't do it. Um, and it was siloed. So data was locked up in different, in different archives. And if you wanted to access that data, you had to come up with some way to access it. Um, I don't know if, if many of you know what that circular object is there that you could hang up in your garden to keep crows away. But a company called America Online used to ship these things to everybody. And they were trying to get us onto their, their network. They were a data provider that uh, existed pre-internet. Um, and if you had a friend, and um, their marketing was all about how you could reach all your friends on it because they had this tremendous reach, but they had competitors. And if I was on CompuServe and you were on AOL, there was some way we could email each other. Good luck if you could figure it out. Um, we don't live in those days anymore though, right? Like today, we, are, we have no difficulty uh, exchanging information. If I want to send you an email, I don't know what internet service provider you have. I don't have to care. I just need your email address and it just works. And if you've ever looked at the marketing information that you might see from an internet service provider, they'll never say, we have all the websites you want. Right? That would be a nonsensical pitch. For Why? Because every internet provider has the same reach. Information just works. And now they have to compete on service, on speed, on how well they fit you, not what information you can reach, because everybody can reach everything. Boy, wouldn't it be great if payments worked that way. So today, money is locked up in distinct systems just like information used to be. If I want to pay you some money, I have to ask you what system you're on. And it's slow. Um, payment, many payment networks shut down outside of business hours. Many payment networks only work in overlapping business hours between the two time zones they make payments between. They take days. They're very uncertain. There are a lot of people who will have to make a phone call to say, did my payment go through? And the payment company will say, we don't know. Call us back in a few more days. Even when payments succeed, they can be painful because there's no confirmation of receipt. And international payments are the most broken. That's kind of why Ripple chose to focus on international payments first. That hurts some of the poorest people in the world with remittances. And the performance that they get is it's just absolutely awful. So the money is siloed. It has to, your money has to be somewhere, and if it's somewhere, it's not somewhere else, and it's never the place that you needed it to be. And that means high costs. That means that there are multiple uh, intermediaries in any payment, and everybody wants a slice of it, and uh, fees are enormous. That's for one of the reasons for financial inclusion. If you're more expensive to serve than a financial institution can make from serving you, they're just not going to serve you. Um, you, we tend to think we're overbanked in the United States because you could just go anywhere and open a bank account, but the, a fairly shocking statistic, 24 Americans are underbanked. And over one, over, almost 2 billion people globally are underbanked. So the financial system is not reaching everybody. And that's painful for customers. So what that means is um, refund processing can be quite painful. About 7% of enterprise payments are lost. 2 to 5% of consumer payments are lost. That just produces a terrible experience for everyone. And it's a nightmare for developers. So on, on, even on a large scale, you might think, um, you know, you look at an Amazon or an Airbnb or an Uber, these companies have hundreds of payment engineers who keep their systems operating with hundreds of payment networks. And if you are a small person, you want to compete with them, you want to start a new business, you want to launch an app, your first step can't be to hire 100 payment engineers to integrate you with 250 payment networks. That's just, that, that's a complete non-starter. So, so let's look at how the internet solved these problems for information, and then we can see how we can solve those same problems for payments. So what are the attributes of the internet? It's everywhere. I'm sure almost everybody in this room has access to the internet right now. It's extremely reliable. It's built out of unreliable parts, but it has high-level technologies that do things like fault tolerance, failover. It just works. And there aren't counterparties. There's no company that you can call up for tech support on the internet, right? Um, you get this substantially the same service wherever you go. 
um, and everything just works with everything else. It's so open that the thought of not connecting an, a network to the internet is almost unthinkable right now. There, if you were proposing a network that wasn't connected to the internet, the question would be, why, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you make it easy for people to access it? Why wouldn't you make it accessible everywhere? Why would you make things complicated? What we want to do is we want to make money move the way information moves. And that's, that, that's, that's obviously a huge task. And we started on enterprise international payments. That the vision is the internet of value. The vision is money moves the way the internet, mo the way the internet moves information. The vision is payment networks interoperate the way data networks operate. The vision is payment networks are as easy to access as information networks are. So that, for, that separated into two buckets. The bucket that we started on first, RippleNet, was an enterprise payment system for financial institutions. They were not ready to make the step to open networks, um, just like moving to the internet would have been pretty radical in the early days of the internet. And so we started building an enterprise payment network that would provide that level of interoperability. But that's not going to handle the developers. For that, we need a network that's open. We need something that's truly open source and accessible like the internet is. So on the enterprise side, we built this payment network called RippleNet using XRP to settle where that makes sense. The problem that that solves is having to pre-position uh, money where you need to make payments. So for example, without some sort of a, a cryptocurrency solution, to make a payment into the Philippines, you'd have to have Philippine pesos sitting in the Philippines. Now, if you want to make payments on Monday, and maybe Friday is a holiday somewhere, you might have to move that money on Thursday or even earlier, and you have to sort of figure out how much money you need, and you have to leave it sitting somewhere. What RippleNet does with XRP is the sender can exchange their sending currency, say US dollars for XRP, send the XRP on the XRP ledger, and buy Philippine pesos precisely when they need them. Ripple recently announced a partnership with MoneyGram. MoneyGram is a remittance company, one of probably the second largest. And they're using XRP to provide liquidity on demand in countries like Mexico, rather than having to pre-place large amounts of Mexican pesos Today, over 200 financial institutions have partnered with RippleNet. You can see there's a mix of banks and non-bank payment institutions that are using RippleNet to move money globally and using XRP to settle their payments where that makes sense. But that kind of leaves out everybody else. And if we want to make payment networks truly interoperable and we want that internet of value, we need to reach everybody. We need to reach developers. And Ethan is going to talk about how that's going to happen. Thanks, David.